car, or if you're just trying to build a better accountancy system or, or you know, run a better business, you need to understand not only about how to build computers, but also how the whole sort of interaction between all these systems work. And I think this is one of the key things that people learn from coding. It's not, it's not just about the sort of dry algorithms and, and equations that most people learn at school. It's actually about how to get things to, to do things, how to... You know, Computational le thinking. Le we're, we're learning about tactics, strategy, <coughs> interaction, collaboration. It's very, very hard to go and write a computer program that does anything useful without interacting with other people, without interacting with other systems. Right. So are you having to recruit more overseas because of this skills shortage then? We, I mean, yes, ultimately. I mean, we, we want to recruit the best from around Europe, um, from around the world. Um, we, we have offices around the world in order to tap into the best people we can find. Um, and we're also going out of our way to help make sure that we nurture the next generation and help build the next generation of people particularly in the UK. What about mentoring, if you're kind of reaching out to young people, mm. particularly talented people? What does Google do in that area? So a, a lot of what we're doing is trying to make sure that we can scale our, scale our influence, if you like. So helping teachers, helping great organisations like Code Academy, like um, Carno Today and, and others, really understanding uh, getting, helping those organisations get the message out to people. Uh, we've been working with Raspberry Pi, we've got 15,000 Raspberry Pis out there into education to try and sort of almost replicate the next, you know, what, what happened with the BBC Micro and get the next generation of people to start thinking about computers as something exciting, something they can play with, they can take to pieces and, and just inspire people in that way. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Zach, tell us a bit about how Code Academy works and how you sort of excite people about technology at the creative end. So we started Code Academy uh, because I was, sort of, among, among other things, because uh, I was teaching myself to program. My co-founder had spent uh, four years doing so uh, in college and sort of started an informal club uh, after school to teach people sort of the basics of programming. And what we learned was that people really like, you know, as Liam mentioned, learning by doing, right? Learning by actually creating something instead of, you know, sitting in an audience and listening to someone talk at you, uh, like you're doing now. The best way to learn often is by, you know, actually doing something, building it, manifesting it in, in its real form. Uh, so we tried to bring that online. And, and I think we tried to remove a lot of the fundamental barriers that Liam mentioned as well that get in the way of, uh, of you know, people beginning to program, which, you know, you stare at a screen, uh, there's a blinking cursor, and it's blank, and you have no idea what to do. And that's a really scary sensation. Uh, so we decided to try to make it sort of as easy as possible uh, for anyone to, to just dive in. So if you go to Code Academy, it's basically uh, page ask for your name is the first step, and kind of introduce yourself to the computer, uh, and you go from there and kind of carry on a conversation to understand what you can actually do with computing. Uh, and that for us has, has kind of paid off in spades in increasing accessibility to different uh, areas of sort of different people that traditionally wouldn't be involved in computer science. Um, Liam again mentioned uh, sort of the, the women issue in computer science, and in the U.S. only 18 percent of computer science graduates are female, and 36 uh, percent of Code Academy users are female. Uh, I think because we make things uh, sort of more accessible, open, and not, it's kind of a closed classroom environment uh, where you look at a classroom and, you know, it's sort of one group of people doing something that's traditionally um, sort of looked at as super difficult and nerdy uh, and not accessible. And, and hopefully by including, you know, coding in the curriculum is a mandatory thing for everyone uh, in, in the UK. We'll see that change a lot because we'll see everyone. Kickstarter project, you know, Sorry, it's like three bars. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Say a little bit about what you're doing on, on Kickstarter because you're a co academy alumni as, yeah. as well. So I, I, yeah, oh, everything to code game, <laughs> pretty much. I started a Kickstarter roughly two weeks ago for making a storybook out of a little girl who travels around the world, and her name is Ruby, and she meets all these magical technology creatures, and it's kind of like a creative way of thinking about programming and, and teaching it to the people, and it seems like internet loved it, because it has $260,000 now, which is like 26 times what I originally pledged for, so pretty cool. <laughs> So I was going to ask, what is, the, what is the challenge here in kind of winning parents over? And Linda's beautiful book is a really good example of that. But how, um, I don't know how much work you've done with 
parents and trying to explain how important code is and sort of what the potential is, but how do you explain it to the lay person? I think we explain it in a couple different ways. There's there's two immediate value propositions for parents, I think. You know, there there's the it teaches you a better way to think kind of argument, which is as Mike mentioned, there are different ways that learning sort of algorithms kind of change the way you think, change your problem solving and sort of puzzle solving ability, make you kind of a better thinker. Um, there's actually a study that MIT did a couple years ago um, with the One Laptop Per Child project that showed that students that learn to program at a young age actually end up being better spellers as they get older, um, you know, because of that attention to detail and a new way of thinking. Uh, so I think we oftentimes try to sell that, that learning programming is not just something that you do or sort of learning algorithms, computer science, it's not something you do just to sit at a computer and program, it's also something you can do to be better kind of at every other subject that you're working on because it changes how you think. Um, but I think an, another argument that, you know, that uh, I think is, is valuable to parents as well is just the, the employability and applicability of the skill. When you look at what students are learning in a lot of classes, oftentimes it's sort of in the abstract and not immediately applicable to whatever they, they end up doing post-graduation. Uh, but programming specifically, you know, with a 900,000 uh, job shortage across Europe, uh, there's almost immediate applicability to the job market. And so we see that that's something sort of very valuable to a lot of parents as well, as they know if their students are learning the skill, uh, they'll have a better future. There's a bit of myth bashing to be done here, isn't there? And certainly the stereotypes of, of developers like Zuckerberg in the film The Social Network um, and, and many, many other examples, are they quite unhelpful? Definitely. Uh, you need, uh, I think you need positive examples of lots of different people uh, learning to program, right? Lots of different positive role models. Uh, and right now we kind of uh, fit them all into one genre, right? If you look at uh, the cover of Business Week in, in the U.S. Uh, this week, it's, uh, it's, it's subject line is, yeah, it's extraordinarily yeah. patronizing. It's, Facebook it's a, reaches puberty. Yeah, the headline is Facebook reaches puberty, and they actually did a behind the cover on uh, you know how Business Week did the photo shoot and designed the cover, and it goes into how they like tried to make Zuckerberg look pimply, uh, and you know they used a font that tried to bring out pimples. Um, which I didn't even think was possible. But, you know, here's someone who's built a $150 billion company uh, and still is, like, shoehorned into this trope of the, like, you know, nerdy uh, guy who sits in the basement with glasses. Um, and there are, beyond him, there are other entrepreneurs out there and other programmers who might not even be entrepreneurs who are successful role models and can mm -hmm. be examples. Uh, but we as a society kind of are looking for this one group of people to represent what it is to be a programmer. I mean, even look at this panel, right? Um, so I, I think definitely more role models and diversity um, you know, would be a good thing to encourage this kind of stuff. You've been on the receiving end of a little bit of media over the last few years, not you personally, <laughs> but, but Google generally. Right. Do you think sort of um, stereotypes in the media about about coding and, and you know, the, the kind of geek stereotype, is that massively unhelpful in encouraging people into the industry? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, there's a terrible story. We, we actually run a whole bunch of um, sort of events trying to get women into the IT industry and trying to help put out that um, better image of women. And I was talking to one of the women who organises it, and she was like, so, 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 how did you get into the IT industry? What, 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 what was it that made you get into this? And it was basically, her parents hated it. The, her parents still, even to this day, I mean, this is one of our top engineers in London, and her parents, even today, are still going to her, going, Why, when are you going to get a proper job? Go and become an accountant. That's a proper job. <coughs> now, if you look at that slide um, from The Economist, you know, that's the sort of number one job that's going to, you're going to lose over the next 20 years, or however they put it. And you know, people still don't seem to think that computer science and, and computer programming and the, the software industry as a whole, they don't seem to think it's an appropriate place to go. And I think that's very sad. Okay, so to bring this back to, to the curriculum, so computer science will be um, massively um, uh, emphasised from September, but... Where do we go beyond that? I mean, there's much more to be done. And the, the biggest challenge, actually, for education is keeping up with industry, isn't it? That's why education loses people like Zach. Yeah, I think that's it. I think part of the um, use of a curriculum previously that was very set in lines of what it did, and the, the soft, even down to the software people used, meant that it was um, never going to keep up with industry. Um, I think this is uh, the, the big thing about the the change is that is the, it, it's, it's putting in place, it's the first start of it. Like all of the processes that we now work in, it is not set in stone. The point is it can change and it, it needs to be able to change to adapt over time. 
but it needs to be flexible. So this is an iterative educational process? That's right. Yes. Okay, and how, and um, this starts from 11, why not make that younger? Why no, there's some, there is some work that is done in primary schools, so you do okay. introduce people to what an algorithm is in a, in a primary school, and that's the starting okay. point for that. And is there any kind of formal outreach to industry? Are you going to be working with um, entrepreneurs? Um, in our area, we're not in that space, but in the, most of the, I think the, the, the the main thing, and especially the speeches today, which um, the ministers are making, is around the fact that large industry bodies, Google, Microsoft, are helping very strongly in the development of this process. Mm. Um, Zach, what would you like to see? I know your experience has been in the US, which is uh, different. But what would you like to see change in education to really engage young people? So I'd, I'd add one thing to that. Our experience is not just in the US. So, so this year we've worked pretty extensively um, <coughs> on providing curriculum, both by working with UK teachers and creating some curriculum of our own uh, for the, the change that happens in September. So I think we are super excited to watch uh, the UK kind of become the first G20 country to implement programming. And, and for us, we are a US-based US co uh, company. 70% of our users are outside of the US. A lot of the UK is our second biggest country. And so we've sort of dedicated a lot of effort uh, to, to being successful here. Um, but I, I would say what needs to change in education is, uh, you know, despite what I think whatever government or education does, uh, we'll always see this persistent gap between education and industry, right? Because uh, it takes, you know, two to five years to implement changes in education. Um, we've spoken with a lot of U.S. cities, for instance, a lot of foreign governments about uh, integrating programming into the curriculum, and it, it's always a three to five year timeline. Uh, and so if you think about whatever industry wants today, it's not going to be the same thing in three to five years uh, when, when it's actually implemented in school. So I think that's why institutions like ours exist, uh, where we actually work with industry kind of to create the materials that are necessary for the jobs of today and the jobs of the future, as opposed to sort of designing curriculum implemented in two to five years, uh, by which point it'll be outdated. And, the, and, and it's... It's very much the case that it needs disruption. It needs to be pushed along. I mean, we were talking last week, I was talking to a company called Manifesto in Walthamstow, who are actually engaged with their local school. They've gone in by themselves to help drive through the change that they see they want to add. And they offer the ability for people to learn more about how a startup works, etc. There's lots of that that goes on. But if we try to systematize that and create a national standard for doing that, I don't think that's going to help. I think a lot of what is going on at the moment is, is, is about encouragement, and I think that's really important. It is, but how do, you, how do you encourage teachers to get involved without them feeling like this is a whole new load of paperwork coming down from on high? Part of it is that we need to have confident teachers in this space, and that's one of the things which has always been um, um, a concern in, in any education system, not Britain and not anywhere, is you need to be able to have confident teachers, and that's why there are some announcements today about funding for, um, to help train master teachers who can help do that. So there's, there's, I mean, several millions of pounds are being announced today around bursaries for teachers, bursaries for teacher training, um, helping create a cadre of around 400 master teachers who can actually go out and then help encourage their colleagues. I mean, it's a, teaching's a competitive business. If you're a good teacher, as we saw, if you're a good teacher, you want other people want to do what you're doing because it works. And, and it's about encouraging that. Is, is, um, that. That's very important to making this happen. But I think, by stand, I, think we, I think by standing up and saying we must systematize everything around this and have a standard that does it, I think that could actually get in the way. No, I think but the there's much, that, much too much sort of systematizing things in education. And actually, it should be less about sort of tests and imposing structures for things and more about <coughs> inspiring people. Yeah, which I mean, is the previous, the previous system, which based, uh, I mean, a lot of it, there was a, a thing called the ECDL, which was very, in the 90s, was a really helpful way of making sure you've got a basic standard of literacy but it became it's rather like a cycling proficiency thing it became a box ticking I can get through this thing and then we make that work and then you've got the you've ticked enough things in the box and that's not the way that um, that education in this space will work I remember talking to someone Debbie Forster who's now very prominent in apps for good in that area where really she should put the line out that awards are the thing you want you want to reward people for doing things well rather than have a series of hurdles you have to get over in order to tick enough boxes to get a piece of paper and with teachers as well you want to encourage a broader range of teachers to to get involved yes yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so there are incentives to help with that and initiatives mm. to help with that so that we, the teachers will become confident in mm. doing this. It's a change in the curriculum. It's a change in the way lots of people are doing things. That's going to need a lot of support, mm. but we're very supportive of them.
That's actually the way we've been trying to approach our, our technology news on The Guardian now, is not writing technology news for people that are interested in technology, but anybody with a mobile phone needs to understand you know, yeah. what this is and how it does yeah, and what it's capable this, of. This is much more than just about coding. Yeah. This, is, this is actually about having a new digital way of life. Yeah, well, it's now the third um, uh, medium of literacy, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Um, sorry, Mike, you wanted to come in. Uh, I think one of the great things about what we're doing now with the curriculum is instead of teaching people about specific pieces of technology, so you know, historically we've kind of, we have went through a phase of teaching people how to use Microsoft Office. You know, fascinating, but by the time you go from school to actually a job, it, it's out of date. Um, and quite frankly, the kids are teaching the teachers most of the time how to use Office. And the teachers are sitting there going, well, I don't really understand it. It's very, very hard for them to keep up. But I think with, with code, we're able to start teaching people not just about the coding itself, but also how to solve problems and how to understand and explore algorithms and such. And like, I think that's where teachers can really come in and they can, you know, they can learn that, they can understand that. Um, we and many, many others can help them with that. Um, and they're actually giving then kids something which they will take forwards for the rest of their lives rather than just the sort of thing that will get them to the next step in the curriculum. I think that's very important. Um, we will go out to questions in a minute, but um, there are a lot of um, initiatives in this area. Young Rewired State does fantastic work with kids. Um, there's Decoded, there's General Assembly, there's Code Academy. There's a huge amount going on, but how do you connect all of these kind of disparate projects with you know, loosely the same aim? Because actually we... The previous panel talked about collaborating, getting people to work together. I think if a lot of these, um, if these projects sort of linked up, we a Tomorrow lot more would I think happen. It's really important. There is no one answer to this, mm. and I think one of the mantras that we live by is "Don't do it all yourself. You can't. You have to be." The whole point about, and in fact, the whole point about the curriculum we're talking about is about collaboration and about going out and finding what's new. And I think it's important that you can, you know, where to look. But beyond that stage, we should just encourage people to, to actually use the many resources that are there. I, don't think, I really don't think we need to stand around and say there is one way of doing this, because there isn't one way of doing this. But if we set a unified target to say, for, say, you know, a million children for this time next year to be able to you know, build their own app or whatever, that would be a positive you know, target, wouldn't it? It would be a lovely and positive target. As you probably notice, I'm not a minister, so I'm not going to say that we should do it. Well, not yet. But so I yet, think... But, uh, yeah. um, OK. Thank you, go and say that, mate. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Go on, should we, should we get a million kids we to We should. Yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. There's your sound bite. OK, do, um, does anyone want any questions? Excellent. Do we have a, a mic? It's the lady at the front. Dawson from Surf and Turf Camps, that's kids' digital STEAM and sport camps. I'm just wondering how people are finding 45 minutes in a curriculum week. Is that offering enough time? If you look at football, you know how many thousands of hours it takes to get to mastery. Um, lots of people have come across code clubs, coder dojos, which try and offer a more relaxed immersion. Um, maybe once a month, and one of, uh, one of the things I wondered is whether we could look at those sorts of opportunities as continuing professional development for teachers, in a way letting them have a free yeah. drop-in creative learning without yeah. somebody watching behind them, and letting them try things out in a relaxed environment, and I wondered what more we could do to try and encourage these free drop-ins, which are irrespective of school, and also the immersion opportunities. There's lots of talk at the moment about lengthening the school year. Could we try and say, let's not have the old um, curriculum challenges, if we have this extra few blocks of time a year, could we use those for some creative immer um, immersion? Need a maker fair once a month yeah, at every school or something. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a really mm -hmm. interesting approach. I think it's a really helpful contribution. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, yes. I, I, th I think that's that's that, those are all great opportunities I think, for people to do. <laughs> and I think one of the things is it's about confidence. It's being about being able to feel confident in what you're teaching and coaching and mentoring people to do and we need more of that yes and part of confidence is that we have this psyche in the in the tech world at least that we're always comparing ourselves to america um, yeah i think that's a really important point because actually yeah. if you look at the the most if you think about the countries that are the most advanced digitally as we look at what a digital government or country would be with someone that you know you adopt open standards, you have an open market which encourages small businesses 
to engage in the market. You have um, a preference actually for um, um, in development for open source. You have um, pervasive internet and you teach children to code. That is New Zealand, South Korea, Israel, Estonia and the UK at the moment. Now that, that's those, the America doesn't do this. It's actually the one area where the states really aren't, aren't there. Well, it, maybe it's that slightly British tendency to be a bit little self-deprecating, but actually we should be incredibly proud of the heritage that we have in technology. So, you know, we should big ourselves up more. A little bit Scandinavian, maybe. Yes. Um, uh, okay, where's the mic? Um, hello, well, there's a lady right next to you. Should we? Good morning, my name's Juliet Upton. I'm leading a project called the Vision for Science and Mass Education at the Royal Society, so not the Royal Society of Arts, but the Royal Society, which is the National Academy of Sciences in the UK. Um, question for the panel. Uh, we've spoken a lot about knowledge and skills and the curriculum, and we've started to talk about teachers, and teachers are critical, clearly, to the delivery of a curriculum in our schools and colleges across the UK. And certainly, the gentleman from Google absolutely knows that we're having a major problem recruiting computer scientists for industry, let alone to teach in our schools. So I know the government has done a lot to create bursaries for shortages in physics and maths teachers, but the reality is it hasn't changed the game. We've had decades of shortages of physics and maths teachers, and we will not necessarily solve the computer science teaching problem in the next decade. So I'd like to hear what the panel thinks about what we can do about teaching Coding and is, computer is, science in schools. It's really critical. That's such a good point. I mean, when a computer scientist can go into a bank and earn double what a head teacher earns, why would they start out being a computer, computer science teacher? Because they want to be a teacher. Teaching is a vocation. That's, that's a really important Which thing. Is, people, don't, know, people don't make... It's a beautiful make... aspirational expression, but um, there is a cold, hard economic truth there, isn't there? Um, yeah, there are differences to what you want to do. I think. I think one thing is just to say that the exigencies of time, I would say it wouldn't be interesting if you could watch what's going to happen in the Ministerial Announcement very soon. You'll be able to know that there is an oh, approach to bursaries. Us. I have to tease you because yeah. actually I got the word embargo written on the piece of paper I saw just now. Um, but uh, there will be an announcement later today. Yeah. <coughs> There's, uh, there will be an announcement about that later today. I think also though, one of the problems with sort of chemistry, the way chemistry and the way physics has been taught historically is they have been taught by road. It's very difficult to discover physics or chemistry. You, you know, your teacher has to know everything on the syllabus. They have to know everything that's going on. And I think we can take a different approach with computer science. I think we can take an, a, an approach of sort of this mixture of gamification, discovery, people learning as teams, people learning as communities. And I think we can teach teachers not to be computer scientists, but to enable yeah, that exactly. mode of discovery. And I think that actually will give us much broader and more um, richer teaching. Just a pitch for the afternoon, we actually did have a science class later on. Where we will <laughs> we'll, we'll see some of that stuff. Um, so yeah. um, hello, I'm Amy, and I'm going back to what was being said before about you the. Introduce yourself, Amy. Even okay. Okay, um, I'm Amy and I'm 14 and I'm from Manchester and I learnt to code using Code Academy at home and now I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, want to go back to what's being said before about learning uh, is 45 minutes in school enough and perhaps going into Make Affairs and Code Dojos. The Manchester Code Dojo is it's a great place to learn to code and there's lots of volunteers there, but it is volunteer led and it's very, very overcrowded. There's loads and loads of people who turn up. It's like sold out within a couple of minutes. Um, I think if we are going to encourage people to go and learn outside of school as well as inside school, we need to provide funding for this because currently um, they can't do anything really much more because they have hundreds of kids wanting to turn up and learn how to code. Um, but they don't really have the space to do that, uh, or the money to do that. Um, and also, going back to what you were saying about why would people want to become teachers if they could go and earn lots of money, I think that we need to encourage people perhaps to co become teachers for a couple of years. Instead of having teachers being teaching being a profession forever, perhaps have it as a profession for a couple of years. So then we have inspirational teachers, and we have teachers who 
have been in school not so long ago and then it's not hindering their career it's kind of something that you go into before having your career kind of thing future education minister <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I just want to ask Marcus, who's here from the LSE, um, which may seem like an unlikely source of coding literacy in the country, but one of the things, as you know, um, you know, the FTSE 100 in this country employs 6.4 million people, all of whom have families, um, all of whom, you know, sell products and services in Manchester, in Wigan, in Bolton, in Strathclyde. And you know, one of the discussions we've all been having is why is it that the two trillion pounds worth of market cap in the FTSE 100, you know, there are four CTOs on the board of FTSE 100. And one of the things that the LSE is, is starting to do is to educate and be part of the solution, to educate, you know, startups, etc. And I think one of the, you know, the joined up things that I think we're all trying to do this year in the year of code, you know, in the run up to September, is not just have kids get excited about coding, but also you will see in the next few months, boards of FTSE doing their hour of code. Um, because I think, you know, you don't just, the kids are actually setting the example. You know, um, so I'd love Marcus, I don't want to put you on the spot. But you have. Um, so to talk about your vantage points, you know, looking from the city's perspective, you know, how the FTSE can actually make a contribution to the education system, as well as us always throwing stones at the government. Um, sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. So, Marcus Stoddard, I'm the head of UK primary markets at the Stock Exchange. Um, I mean, I think the point is, it's not just about coding, it's about how do we put, you know, business and, and financial services back into the real economy, you know, in the way that, I, you know, I think we've been trying to do um, things like, you know, London Stock Exchange published a report just before Christmas, 1,000 companies to inspire Britain. You know, I think that there's a much greater link up between business and, and education and, and the real economy. So look, there, there are clearly a lot of things that you know, we can do. I think this is a great initiative. I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of sat here partly as a parent and you know, that chart that you showed earlier about company, uh, you know, um, kids involvement, I, I, mean, I can see that you know, for my own kids and I think it's, I think there's, this is a great initiative. I'm sure there are ways that we can get not just the FTSE 100, because let's not always you know, kind of single out one segment of, uh, of business, but you know, listed companies. Yeah, I, I know, but, but actually, so, you know, maybe it's as we've seen with some of the AIM companies from a, 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 um, a business perspective, maybe it's some of the smaller companies that we need to get. To, to lead the way and to show some big business, you know, make them feel a bit more guilty about some of this stuff. So let's not just pick on the, the largest. All right, but I'm, there's a great opportunity out there. And thanks, thanks for not picking on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a chap here who's been waiting patiently. Waiting impatiently. <laughs> yes, impatiently. Hi, my name is Ben Barton. <coughs> um, I run a game-based learning company called Zondal. Um, we've got about half a million users, 20 million questions every month um, on Zondal. 80% of that traffic happens in the US. Okay? And just a point to the panel, particularly the guys at the end. One of the issues is that in Los Angeles Unified District in the States, there are more tablets in that district than there are in schools, according to BISA figures, in the UK. So... The last time I, learned, I, I looked, you needed a device to be able to do any coding. If you go into any primary schools, there's one computer in the corner, there's a sock and great whiteboard there, and then there's a computer suite that the rest of them have to go to. Now, I worked out that a Chromebook's 200 quid roundabout. So if we were to give a year seven a Chromebook, that's 130 million quid. Now, I'm sure you guys on the end could come up with a deal, but this is what we need. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sure you could actually, there is a negotiation to be had because unless we have the devices in the hands of kids, 
I won't have a business in this country. I'll have a business in the US, but I won't have it here. Okay, and all my kids, my three kids, will not learn how to code, except on my device using Code Academy. So I just think that something does need to be done. An excellent point. Thank you. Um, I won't say in lieu of all that tax, but it would be nice if you made a donation of, uh, you know, a Chromebook for every British school. Can you pledge that right now? I, I think I'm going to plead not being the minister on this one. <laughs> no, he'd the, we, we, we are, I mean, we, with Raspberry Pi, we are, we've given 15,000 Raspberry Pis to schools. We've okay, also, that's a start. It is a start. It is a, I think it's an excellent start. You know, we, we, are, we are working very carefully with schools to try and get kit into the hands of kids, actually build up exactly what you're suggesting. Um, whether giving tablets and, and Chromebooks to the schools is the right approach or not. Should we ask them? Yeah, I think, Jemima, there's, 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 a re there's, there's a really important point on this, is, is, is what you're identifying is the, the question that we don't ask at the beginning of when you kit out a school, or haven't asked when you kit out a school, and I started a, a, um, you know, a free school recently, and one of the things you ask is what is the user need? It's the first question we have to ask around any system that we build or anything that we deliver. And if we're not answering that question correctly, we then need to go back to the basics and say, okay, so what is the user need? What should children have in school? It may well be that what children need to have in school is tablets, a tablet for each child. It may well be. I don't know whether we've asked that question effectively or well enough now. One of the issues that we have is we have a very large amount of the IT that's delivered in schools is delivered through PFIs. Hmm. Um, I remember once meeting a guy from Dell who said his biggest customer was a building company. Well, actually, because that was where they were putting all, they were selling all the computers to the schools through a building company so they could build those fabled IT suites with an interactive whiteboard. Um, and don't get me going on those. Um, I think it's, it's really important. We need to th continually think what is the user need. Now, in order to do that, you need to have a flexible procurement policy and a flexible procurement approach in schools, which is what, dare I say it, this government is bringing in. And that's one of the things we've demonstrated in the um, in central government, and it's probably one of the things we'll look at in next in um, the schools, local government, and health, is actually base your services around the user need. Because if you don't do that, people won't use them, and you'll be spending boondoggles of money on IT systems, which we've never actually made the best use of. And we I know. You have a very good track record yeah. with saving money on, on software. We know that. We have a friend from uh, Finland. That's right. Hi. Uh, my name is Johanne. I come from Finland. I'm. Uh, Actually, working with, with uh, Linda over here, we're uh, doing a, a report for the Finnish government and some of uh, our sponsors in Finland on how to, like, how should we actually go about uh, making like actual change in Finland? You know, teaching kids programming in school. And uh, what's really amazing to us is that, like, here in the UK, you have managed to make this kind of a commitment by about like how to start this thing, uh, like actually teaching programming really soon. Um, can I get some like a like one pointer each? Or what you, what would you guys like from like each of your expertise? What would you recommend us doing like a, uh, in Finland not to get caught in like a political debate or like how to get the actual teachers involved? Something like that you should like from your point of view. What would you recommend us doing if we want to get like concrete, quick change? Um, a lot of it's based on show somebody something that's working. Get on a ferry and go to Tallinn, and also and see what they're doing there. It's the easiest place to see it. And it's the cheapest place to send people, and it will introduce the competition you need to help people realise that there are there are people. Com there is a competition there, which um, Finnish students will have to compete with Estonian students. Sorry. I think making the commitment is the first step, right? What the government here has done is say we're going to do this, and now you know maybe we're assembling the airplane on the way, uh, but. At the same time, I think that, that adds the urgency to this, right? Um, and one of the things that, that makes this easy is to maybe start in a way that doesn't bear as much risk, right? So start a bunch of after-school clubs across uh, schools, maybe that are government-supported, uh, and once those have proven to be efficient and, and um, you know, uh, run well, then you can actually bring the, the, what you've learned into schools after that as well. Okay. Uh, I think the, the, the most important thing, as, you've already, as Liam already said, it is showing where it works. Show, showing that it matters. Um, I think if you go to any company, any, I mean, small, medium, large, um, before I was at Google, I was actually CTO of an AIM company, um, not one of the four, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, even, if, even with a small company with, with a staff of sort of 20 or 30 engineers, the 
spread of nationalities and the, the diversity of those engineers from across the planet and showing people that they are competing on that global spread. And also, I, I, was really at, I was at Slush in November, which is a phenomenal event, um, and you should be amazingly proud of that. I think if you can just take school children to Slush, their whole new life will open up before them. A supercell, Rovio, yeah, there's yeah. so much amazing stuff happening in yeah. Finland. Um, any more questions? Yes, there's a lady at the back. Hi there, Christiana Camazotti again from Silicon Milk Roundabout. Um, I just wanted to also tell you about something. Um, I went to the Woman of the Year lecture, and I can see a few ladies here from the Woman of the Year lecture last week. And it was given by Helen Clark, who's the longest running, uh, longest served Prime Minister, I think she ran for three terms in New Zealand. Anyway, um, she said something that really resonated with me, so I asked her a question. What she said was, you cannot fully innovate or help the economy with only half the workforce. So I looked around that room, and I was actually the only woman in tech at this lecture, which was actually terrifying, and believe me, I'm not the best woman in tech. Um, so I asked her, how do we get more women into tech? And she said the answer is education, education, education. And that's how she got women into politics, was she became the role model. And then they started earlier and earlier, telling kids to get into politics. Uh, but the main thing that she said that we could start now was to actually put quotas in. So quotas for women directors in uh, tech businesses. And we're actually going to start doing this at Silicon Milk Roundabout, our event, where we offer subsidized pitch spaces for bootstrap startups. So we're going to make sure that 50% of those go to uh, female co-founders or CTOs. So hopefully uh, that's, that's a little bit inspirational and hopefully others can follow our lead. Because it's absolutely critical, but I think in the same way that we don't really show enough of the role models around tech and not just engineers sitting in dark rooms, but actually there are a huge amount of women, particularly in the UK, who are involved in tech. Martha uh, Lane Fox will be here later. Jemima is explaining tech to 60 million monthly uniques. Uh, at 19. The Guardian. 90! <laughs> and they said editorial didn't sell ads. Uh, Davinia, please. Co-founder, CEO of a small company called Mind Candy that makes Moshi Monsters. Um, Laura Wade Geary runs uh, tech and digital uh, at Marks and Spencers. Uh, Nina Bacha uh, runs uh, The Connected Home at British Gas. Um, and uh, I think the two people who are leading the BBC's Year of Code, 100% women um, on that leadership team. So I, I think we often don't just sort of acknowledge the fact that maybe in the same way that you were saying Brits a bit like stand back, there are actually a lot of women doing this. So. You know, I, I there feel, can be more, but we should also recognise the women who are actually doing this. I, I feel uniquely qualified on this panel to, um, to talk about this. Um, but I, I, it's an observation of mine that there are, um, there are women working really hard to, to do things to encourage women, but they often, they're women-only events, which doesn't really work, I think, because this is about changing attitudes and experience and the mindset of everybody. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a collaborative process. It's not to put anybody's... Um, efforts down, but I do think that's key. With the Swiss timekeeper, sorry.